Welcome to our podcast series, Talking with Traders, hosted by expert trader Garth McKenzie in London, from where he's interviewing various guests on the topic of trading. Welcome back to another season of Talking with Traders with me, Garth McKenzie. This is the sixth season of the podcast, and we're into our third year since the podcast began in 2020. Once again, IG have come on board as sponsor and agreed to fund this podcast for another season. We really are privileged to have such a global leader in CFDs trading as our podcast sponsor. Over the coming weeks, I'll be interviewing various guests from around the globe to bring you their market insights. I'll be digging in to find out what makes them tick, how they see the markets in the year ahead, and what techniques they will use to succeed in the markets. Some of the guests will be returning guests from previous seasons, and some will be new guests that I've managed to convince to join me to give up their time and share their insights. As we enter 2023, there's as much uncertainty as ever around where the markets may be headed in the next 12 months. We've just come off a horrid year for investors in 2022, where a typical 60-40 portfolio delivered its worst annual return in several decades. But what of 2023? Will the US lead the world into a global recession, or will the central banks manage to achieve a soft landing for the global economy? Will inflation come under control as base effects kick in and supply bottlenecks open up? Will US earnings hold up in the face of a weak economy, or will they disappoint? Will we see continued weakness in the US dollar? I'll be asking these and many other questions to my guests in the coming weeks. The idea behind these podcasts is for you to get a variety of views from a broad spectrum of market professionals. None of this is intended to be seen as financial advice, but it is intended to get you thinking and to weigh up what possible paths the market may follow in the year ahead. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast in your favorite podcast app. That way you'll be notified of upcoming episodes as they get released. Once again, thanks to IG for sponsoring this podcast for a third consecutive year. Thanks for joining me and please enjoy season six of Talking With Traders. Welcome back to another episode of Talking With Traders. And this time the the podcast takes us far to the west, the west side of the United States. We're going to Seattle to speak to someone who I've really been looking forward to talking to for some time. His name is David Keller, and he's the chief market strategist at stockcharts.com. So if you're into markets and you follow anything in financial markets media, really, I'm sure you probably heard of David. He's got a big media presence out there and some very, very solid sound good advice and good thinking. I always appreciate Dave. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Garth, thanks so much for the invitation and uh, and congrats on the show. I've I've really enjoyed actually watching some of your other discussions and I'm excited for it. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, you know, what I've really enjoyed about particularly this sixth season of the podcast and, and we're approaching a hundred thousand total downloads now um, is that it, it, with that, it kind of becomes an easier sell to get uh, bigger guests on the shows like yourself. (laughs) If you can go and you can say, you know, we've spoken to Stephen Goldstein and Steve Ward and JC Peretz and some of those kind of people, um, it it becomes an easier sell. So thank you. And it's good to see the podcast gaining some traction but uh, with, with that in mind Kat, you're a, you're a new guest uh, and as i always like to do with new guests i like to just get a little bit of a background um, i mean obviously i know a fair amount about what you do but perhaps some of the listeners don't so if you could just give us a brief background into where you've been what your careers looked like to this point and then obviously what you do right now Absolutely. So there's a there's a, a cyclical nature, I think, to the markets. I think there's even a cyclical nature probably to my career as well as with as with many. Um, I've been in the industry for about 23 years now. I actually started in uh, grew up in the Midwest of the United States in Ohio right. and uh, and grew up there and then moved to the New York area in the northeast of the U.S. Uh, and joined Bloomberg. And that was in June of 2000. So if you know your U.S. market history, I basically moved to New York and started in the financial industry just as the tech bubble was bursting yeah. and as sort of all the things that we believed were were going to happen forever in the 1990s all came to a crash and, and sort of changed very, very quickly. So what I, it's funny, I learned my formative years of learning technical analysis and learning markets was during a period of instability and a period of uncertainty. 
And the investors that I worked with that were most successful in that period were chart were chart users, and they were able to see the very clear signs of a rotation from a bull market phase to a bear market phase. And that lesson stuck with me. And I think a lot of what I use now is still sort of uh, started in that foundational period. So I was in New York uh, at Bloomberg from 2000 to 2008, had an opportunity to work with a lot of institutional investors um, on a lot of trading floors in the Northeast, a lot of hedge funds. Uh, and then was able to leverage that into uh, a, a work at Fidelity, where I joined in 2008. And I ran the technical research department there for about eight and a half years. Okay. So we would advise all of the equity portfolio managers running all the Fidelity mutual funds on what stocks to buy or sell based purely on technical inputs. And that was a really fascinating opportunity to work with I mean, fund managers like Peter Lynch and Bruce Johnstone, who are incredibly successful in their in their days, and then people like Will Danoff and Joel Tillinghast and uh, and Jeff Feingold and and uh, more of the modern uh, fidelity portfolio managers, you know, again and and seeing how they would in incorporate technical analysis into their process. Okay. Um, then I started my own firm in 2017. And uh, and then uh, joined uh, StockCharts.com and moved to the northwest of the U.S. in the Seattle area about uh, boy almost four years ago now. Right. Uh, and now my my role is basically to help individual investors and financial advisors to understand the markets better and make better decisions. A lot of what I focus on is decision making and mindset and investor psychology. And uh, and and yeah, it's been it's been a fascinating ride so far. The market continues to uh, to give us new things to to think about and worry about, I guess. <laughs> uh, it, it always does. And I mean, uh, I think that's one of the things I certainly love about the market is that no mm -hmm. one day is ever the same. And is that yeah. old thing that, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. And I guess uh, right now we're going through some possibly rhyming times uh, in, in certain respects. <laughs> Looking back to yeah, previous times where we've had inverted yield curves and you know imminent recessions and so on. So we're we have plenty to worry about at the moment, I suppose. But it keeps <laughs> it interesting. <laughs> but but I mean, th those are fundamental factors, right? And and you're a predominantly a, a technicals guy, as you've said. Sure. Um, you've got the CMT de designation, Chartered Market Technician, um, which I know is not that easy to get. So well done on that. Uh, it's something that I'd still like to do in, in my in my career, but I haven't gotten to that yet. Um, but for you, what what is it that makes technicals your go to in terms mm -hmm. of the decision making? And I mean, do you yeah. do you look at the fundamentals as well? Uh, I, mean, I guess you can't ignore the fundamentals, right? But when it comes to making a trading decision, you know, what kind of weight do you give to technicals versus weight do you give to fundamentals? Yeah, so I've spent most of my time in the industry working with non-technically oriented investors, whether they're fundamental portfolio managers or brokers who are looking at a lot of different things. And so I've spent a lot of my time trying to think about how I relate technical analysis to other disciplines. And I would say in my own process, it mirrors sort of what I've learned uh, from successful investors, which is technical analysis is an important piece, but it is a piece of the overall picture. I, I tend to think of it as a stool with four legs. Yeah. And I would say that those legs are fundamental, macroeconomic, behavioral, and technical. And those yeah. are the four things that any trader, any investor really needs to um you know to to understand and and improve on if they're going to find success consistently if you use one or two of those you'll have intermittent success but having consistent performance means you need to be able to foster all those so for me i would describe it as the fundamental side are really understanding the companies and the sectors what drives them and which are set up for success based on where we're at in the business cycle. I would say that is the goal of my fundamental approach and thinking of ways to identify strong companies. The technical approach is recognizing that um, you have to understand the information the market provides back to you in the form of how investors are making decisions and how those decisions are reflected in how asset prices move and, and thinking about what's working and what's not, and recognizing the fact that trends evolve over time. The behavioral side is super important to me as well. And I tend to think of myself as both behavioral and technical because we are hardwired to make really bad decisions about the world, about, about, <laughs> about our investments. Yeah. And so the technical toolkit for me is, is primarily to help me not make the bad decisions I would make if I wasn't looking at a chart to keep myself honest and keep myself consistent. And then the the last piece was sort of macroeconomic. And you hit on things like, 
you know, the Federal Reserve in the U.S. and and a tightening cycle and, um, you know, global instability with uh, Russia and the Ukraine, um, and all of those different pieces and how they relate, the election cycle in the U.S. and being in a pre-election year. At the end of the day, you have to understand that stocks and ETFs and futures don't trade in a vacuum. They trade in that context of all those other things happening. So I bet for your listeners, uh, you know, one or two of those you probably have a really good handle on and one or two of those you don't. And I would encourage people to focus on the one or two that you do, you are not as intimately comfortable with. Yeah. That's where you can improve your process. Absolutely. Yeah. Always try and focus on where you can improve dead, dead mm-hmm. right. Um, I, D- d- sidetrack slightly here. I saw in your bio that you studied music and you've got, you're, yeah. you're pretty well qualified as a musician, right? Sure. Uh, um, that that is there a, a relationship, do you think, between that? There's pattern recognition in music, reading music, right? Um, and pattern yeah. recognition in charts. So I don't think I've ever interviewed anybody who is, is, a, is a musician by training who has yeah. sort of uh, transitioned to, to, to trading. But it's mm. interesting, and I thought I'd ask you that question. That's real. I, thank you so much for asking that, Garth. I appreciate that. I wish it came up more in conversations because I'm I'm super passionate about. It. I actually studied a uh, trumpet and voice as an undergraduate, and and my undergraduate degrees are in music and psychology, mm. and it seemed like a big waste of two degrees when I went into the financial industry. But somehow those two degrees really set me up well to be a market strategist. Yeah. <laughs> the psychology makes sense because it's all. I mean, I would argue that investing is all about understanding other investors and what their motivations are. And if they're excited or nervous or desperate or euphoric, all of that impacts stock prices. I think that's a a given. Yeah, Music's a little bit different, but what's funny is I actually first learned about Fibonacci numbers, which uh, a lot of the traders use as a way Mm. to identify turning points. I actually learned it when I was studying music because you would, you know, the, the, the musical scale, the harmonics, uh, you know, overtones here is all based on Fibonacci numbers. A lot of composers actually, use those relationships. So it was very funny. I remember when I first learned about applying it to trading and I was like, oh, that's an interesting way to apply the Fibonacci sequence. I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> but, but I'll tell you the best story that relates music to investing is this one. What, one of the things I studied was orchestral conducting. So mm-hmm. you're standing in front of a group of 100 musicians and you glance down at a piece of music. And while you're trying to get that group of musicians to communicate some emotional thing through their mm-hmm. through their instruments or through their voices, you have to glance down at a piece of music and an orchestral score has, you know, 15 odd parts. It's a lot of information and you have to glance down and you're basically doing pattern recognition, right? You look at, you have to quickly at a glance, figure out who has the melody, who's supporting that melody, who's, you know, where there's tension, where there's release, where there's, you know, people playing together, where there's people playing differently. And then you have to anticipate what's coming next because of your knowledge of music history in that period. So you kind of know where a composer is going to go because you know what that style of music is. And when I first looked at a chart of a stock with technical indicators on it, I felt like I'd been training to do that for years because (laughs) you're basically looking for patterns and you're looking for trends and you're anticipating what's coming next based on your knowledge of market history and and market analysis. And so it's very, very funny that that idea of patterns and and uh, understanding how uh, what you're looking at now relates to what you've seen before is literally what I do every day. So it's very funny. There's a whole um, there's a whole community of musicians. There are a lot of guitar players, bass players, horn players like myself, singers. Yeah. So at some point, there will be a great uh, band. We will all be in together uh, at some point. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, I'm so glad I actually asked the question because that answer yeah. was a lot more colorful than I <laughs> than I thought. And it, but it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's amazing to know. And I, do, I mean, I've got not a, not a single musical bone in my body. So unfortunately, <laughs> I didn't know that the Fibonacci sequences also relate to to music. Yep. Um, yep. It's amazing how, how much that Fibonacci the Fibonacci ratios actually connect into various nature and things all over the world, which we, we take for granted. Yep. Very, very very true. Very interesting. So what is your style of trading? I'm I'm guessing that because you're helping clients coaching in a way uh, and and doing your analysis for stockcharts.com and elsewhere, writing blog articles and whatever, I'm guessing you're not a, a one of the traders that stares into the screen all day, hitting the buy and sell button too regularly, right? Are you more of a sort of a position trader, swing trader? How would you define your style? 
Yeah, I probably describe myself as a position trader more than anything. So my my goal is to look. I mean, honestly, with the with the investors I tend to work, I work with a lot of longer term investors, a lot of financial advisors or wealth managers that are trying to think about multiple cycles in multiple years. So I'm usually looking about one to three months out on yeah. average. But yeah. as you as you know, right, your time frame is fluid, and sometimes mm. the market conditions will stretch or compress your time frame depending on on what happens. But that's kind of on average what I'm what I'm looking at. So as a result, I spent a lot of my time looking at weekly and daily charts of pretty much everything, stocks, ETFs, futures, commodities, currencies, yeah. all with the goal of trying to understand how these different pieces are related. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny. I find a lot of times when people are confused about what's going on in the markets, not that charts have all the answers, they, they don't necessarily do, but they certainly point you to what questions you should be asking. Mm -hmm. So for example, right now, when I'm looking at the markets, I, I do a routine every morning called the morning coffee routine. I literally get the cup of coffee and I start going through a bunch of charts and, and I just go one by one through a list of about 100, 150 charts every day. And today I'm struck again by the fact that the US equity markets have rallied, but rallied up to resistance. Yeah. And there are certain areas of the market like technology, particularly semiconductors, gold and gold stocks, uh, which may be of interest certainly to to uh, to, to viewers in your area, yeah. you know, are all sort of doing very, very well. But the average stock in the U.S. is actually doing pretty poorly or, yeah. you know, flat to down year to date. Right. You look mm -hmm. at healthcare, industrials, the rest of materials. Um, you know, these are areas that are that are struggling. So if you take sort of that mega cap tech consumer trade out, the average stock's actually struggling. So the regular review of charts helps me to think about what's working and what's not. And I my goal is in general to rotate into what's working and to lean away or underweight the things that are not working and doing that consistently has served me very well. Mm, okay. You you mentioned your morning routine then actually what that was the next question I was wanting to ask you because I know in, yeah. in some of the blog articles that you've written and, and that I've read, you've you've spoken about your morning routine. And uh, and I wanted to ask you kind of what does that look like? I think you've alluded to it a little bit now about going through charts. Is it yeah. is it a very sort of standardized, rigid process in terms of, you know, do you start by looking at sectors and then look at stocks? And, or, 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 what, what does that routine kind of look like? So I will tell you, I will start off with that answer by saying what I what I see a lot of people do very incorrectly, which is the worst things I think you can do is fire up like financial media or look at your brokerage account or something like that. Because the moment you do that, everything I just said is trying to get you. It is trying to force you to be more short-term. It's drawing you into what I call the flickering ticks, yeah. the short-term movements in the market. And, and maybe that's where you want to be. Maybe you're day trading, which is fine. But I would argue that is not where you should start your process. You want to you want to generally go macro to micro, big picture to small picture, um, you know, uh, broad to, to small. And so for me, I have a set of things that I do every morning and it starts with a five-year weekly chart of the S&P 500. And right. every morning, it's the same chart that I look at. It doesn't change much every day. And that's kind of the idea, right? If I want to think about the markets and if my goal is to think a couple months out, I should be starting my analysis with, all right, where are we at? Where have we come from? And by looking at five years of data, you can see sort of that long-term multi-year time frame and understand the choppiness that we've experienced from 21 to 22 to 23 so far you get that what i call the medium term time frame which is sort of like you know a couple months out which is yeah. telling you you know where have we come off of the october lows where are we at right now on the s p versus the february high yeah. and are we having enough momentum to power through it and then we have what i call the short-term time frame which is a couple days to a couple weeks and mm -hmm. and thinking about you know, testing resistance and where we're at relative to those key levels. And and so by starting with that long-term data, I can then start to get closer and closer. So I have a same set of charts that I go through every day and it's, you know, starting with the S&P, then it's going through, uh, you know, sort of different US indexes like the NASDAQ and, um, and the Wilshire 5000 and small caps. And then it's looking at global markets like South Africa and the UK and Japan and India and China and Brazil and thinking about how all those things relate back to the US and often uh, you know driven by the dollar's strength or weakness a lot of times yeah. I, I, I would argue then it's going through other markets like commodities currencies uh, bonds and interest rates and then getting into a lot of detail about US equities and ETFs and and looking at sectors industries Themes like, uh, you know, momentum versus quality versus, uh, you know, uh, different things like that. 
uh, and then getting into individual stocks and scanning for stocks on yeah. the move. So overall, that process takes me about 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how wow. how how quickly I want to go through it. But the days that I don't do that, around 2 p.m., I'm looking around thinking, okay, what is going on? Like, why, why do I not have a good handle? And the days that I have, everything just kind of makes sense because it's all kind of adding to that picture I've already kind of created in my head. So mm -hmm. I, I think most, most traders that I've met that are struggling, I can usually find some inconsistency th with their routine that while that might not be the only thing that needs to be fixed, it certainly is an important part of that. So I would encourage people uh, listening or, or watching to think about what's that time? What do you do the first thing? What's your morning coffee routine? You get the cup of coffee. What do you do next? And and think about having a deliberate, thoughtful way of yeah. structuring that. I think that's uh, it's super important. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I do something similar. What, what I wanted to ask you as well here, and we'll give uh, stockcharts.com a good plug on this one. I mean, I, I do a lot of my charting and scanning using stockcharts.com. Um, I've got the paid for member. I'm not one of the yeah. cheap skates who uses the free the free <laughs> one. <laughs> it's worth paying for. If you're a listener to the podcast, it's really worth paying for the stockcharts.com um, extra membership or there's there's an, a level above that as well. Um, yep. But it gives you a lot of screening and, and filtering functionality. Have you set up that stock charts to help you with that morning routine process so that it makes it quicker? Because I certainly yeah. have. I, I find... You know, being able to filter stocks that, for example, all the stocks that are above the 50 day moving average or yep. all the stocks that are oversold or, you know, there's, there's, you know, so many different things that you can create, but I've, I found that it makes the, the, the filtering that morning routine process a lot easier. So. A hundred percent. And I would say, so two things that I would use on stock charts, I use the chart list feature very often. And that's yes. basically, you know, instead of having like a watch list, what what, what we do is actually uh, you, you have a chart list. So you have a list of charts mm -hmm. and it has tickers just like a watch list would, but, but it's also a list of, it's a grouping of charts that have meaning. So mm -hmm. every one of those things I mentioned, like looking at global equity markets, looking at US indexes, looking at intermarket analysis, looking at sectors, I have chart lists already set up with all of my notations on there. So every morning I'm looking at the same set of charts. I'm seeing what I was seeing yesterday. I'm updating any notes or any levels that I think are important, but finding a consistent place to do that has been has been uh, a, a huge upgrade. When I did it sort of sporadically on my own, a lot less uh, a lot less effective. So using that has been helpful. The scanning engine I use often, and I would say if you want to take a group of stocks like um, you know the U.S., the Nasdaq, or a, a group of ETFs or any index or any any group of stocks and understand what's happening. I think you set up four scans, which I do on stock charts. The one, the first two would be stocks that are overbought or oversold, because that immediately tells you the things that have gone vertical to the upside and vertical to the downside. What are the things that yeah. have really had a significant move? And then the other two sets of screens are stocks making new three-month highs and new yeah. three-month lows or 65-day highs and lows, mm -hmm. because that often will find things that are not sort of overextended, but things that have had been beaten down that are just starting to improve. Yeah. And when I look back to 2021, which is a pretty consistent bull market with limited drawdowns uh, in on the S&P versus 2022, which is obviously a very different market yeah. where you know it was no longer buy on the dips, but sell the rips type of environment. Yep. Looking at those scans and just seeing the rotation, it was, it was hard not to recognize the tide shifting so so obviously, but I would credit that morning cough routine and those scans that I mentioned as being just an easy way of recognizing all of a sudden nothing's overbought anymore. It tells you that things are drying up and that there's yeah. a lack of buyers. So running those scans consistently, I think has been really, really valuable. Yeah, 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 good. I liken it to to scratching in the dirt looking for diamonds. Um, and I mm. suppose that maybe <laughs> talks to my South African roots. But I mean, you know, if you're not scratching, you're not going to find anything. Um, and you'll scratch around. Sometimes you find a small diamond and, you know, you dig up a lot of dirt, but every once in a while you'll dig out a big diamond. But if, mm. if, if you're not, if you're not scratching, you ain't going to find anything. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it sounds like a similar kind of a, a, a routine, I guess, um, or a similar Absolutely. way of thinking about it and talk to me about risk. Um, uh, you know, there's, there, there's so many different schools of thought uh, about where you set your stop loss, how much you allow yourself to lose on a trade and all that. I mean, obviously the the well-known one is the old 2% rule, rule, lose 2% of your capital, no more than that. Um, yeah. A lot of traders that I speak to think that's way too high. 
personally i also do uh i think maybe it's maybe it's also just that the guys that i speak to are like yourself and myself we've got a few gray hairs and uh we we're a bit more understanding of the risks but i mean i i, I used to risk two percent of my capital on a single trade and you, know, you get three or four or five of those wrong in a row it's suddenly quite a big drawdown that you find that yourself hurts. in so yeah. so i mean what for you what's the number and, and what is your philosophy around risk yeah, I w and I would say that one of the great things, you mentioned the CMT exams, I would say one of the things that I really learned going through the CMT exam, which is just a structured way of learning technical analysis, was it really helped you think about risk versus reward. And in my time at Fidelity, we talked a lot about just, you know, if if we don't want to get, I mean, if we basically just want market returns, we could just buy an index or buy a risk-free bond essentially and just and just and just sit back and do nothing but if we're trying to generate outperformance then we're taking on risk for the opportunity of of additional reward and you have to think of that relationship and i think thinking of that risk component it's a couple of things it's bet sizing right it's how you size your positions it's how you manage downside risk in i mean literally capital loss in the individual positions and how you think about risk on a on the portfolio level right and think yeah. about what sort of bets you're making. And, and I would say that that third one is one that I see people, they don't understand the risks that they're taking based on, you know, a lot of times you'll have way more concentrated bets than you than you realize. And I, I find a lot of people do that with ETFs. Yeah. They'll have a number of different ETFs and I'll look at it and I'll say, all right, you know, you're basically owning Apple and Tesla here. Like that is the bet you're making. And if those work, <laughs> like that's great. But, and if that's the bet you want, fine. But like, you better understand that that is a very narrow bet that you're making. Yeah. And I find that ETFs have made that way more easy to have unintended bets that you might. And so a lot of times you're just betting on large cap stocks or on a particular sector or a lot of times individual names. So I would certainly encourage people to think about the risk inherent in, in that. Um, but for me, I, I think what you implied in your question is really good, which thinking about you know, um, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, as one of my mentors used to say, then your your position sizes are too big. Yeah. And thinking about what you're allocating to each idea. And I would encourage people when you're thinking about risk, when you're thinking about bet sizing, is always think about volatility and how that relates to it. That was one of the big takeaways I got from working with institutional investors. You would always be thinking about you know, how you're weighting your bets based on the volatility, which is essentially the risk that you're taking on. What are the chances that the that the thing's going to move with you or against you? And recognizing that 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 you need to define that or at least have an understanding of it. And so, you know, if you're looking at a utility stock versus a biotech stock versus in the e-commerce name versus a an, an industrial like Caterpillar, the volatilities in each one of those are very, very different. And so your bet sizing better reflect that. And I think with your stops as well. So my my average, my, my general approach is to use some sort of volatility component. Nice. So using average true range, or uh, we have a system called the chandelier exit, which uh, Alexander Elder uh, popularized in, uh, in some of his books that I think it's based on an average true range. I think it's a really good dynamic stop. So the more volatile the instrument, the more room you have to give yourself to, uh, you know, for the market to move against you. But, you know, being thoughtful about each one of those pieces, I think, is uh, ha has really helped me to, I think, have a much better sense of the bets that I'm taking. And, and a lot of times, you know, when, when the market moves against you, it's not that you had a really well-constructed bet and the market just moved against you. A lot of times there's just an issue with how you created that, right? You just didn't set it up right. And yeah. those are things that are in your direct control. You can't change what the market's going to do. You can change how you place orders and where you place your stops and how you spend your time. So spend the time on the things you can change and you can improve on and don't worry about what the market's going to do tomorrow. That'll yeah. take care of itself in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. Absolutely. I mean, you can't, yeah, you can't, the market ain't going to, listen to you or it's not going to move right. to your will it's uh it's how you behave and it's how you respond to what the market is doing i suppose so i yeah. mean you you didn't fully answer well you did answer the question but i guess what i'm trying to understand is do, do you have a set amount like do you say i'm only willing to risk half a percent on a trade or or yeah. does it vary i mean you know are you more aggressive on certain things you know is it not a is it not a hard and fast rule so I don't have as much of a hard and fast rule. I would say my general approach, certainly with my own investing, is I do uh, sort of the core and explore approach, or yeah. the uh, you know we call it like the the satellite and or the the you know different ways of, of of describing that of basically having a core position which is lightly traded if at all, and then uh, you know smaller percentages that are that are exploratory. When I switched to that model a number of years ago, that helped me greatly. 
because what was happening was I would have bets that, you know, all of a sudden would become very large bets. And all of a sudden I would realize I had a very concentrated portfolio way more often than I wanted to yeah. by thinking about a core position that I would change slowly every month. I rebalance that and then smaller positions, which I'm able to take on the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm making more aggressive bets with smaller positions that immediately Give, gave me a much more, uh, you know, relaxed approach to how I how I okay. think of my own own investing. And so I would encourage people to think about that relationship. Yeah. So within the exploratory portion, 2% is probably the maximum I would do on any any given idea. Okay. It's usually more in the 1% range. And that, that's yeah. about right for me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Good. Good. And you, you deal with a lot of traders. Um, you mentioned you, you know, help institutional traders. I'm sure you help some, some retail, maybe high yeah. net worth traders and well. So you've seen a lot. What, what, is there anything particular that you think that the, well I mean, the, I, that the successful traders do that really stands out from the unsuccessful traders? I and mean, I know there's it's a broad question, right? There's lots of answers, yeah. but I'm interested to hear your take on that. Yeah, hey, really good question. And it's funny, we've already talked about so many things that I, I hope people internalize and, and improve on. If there's one of the things that I would find that um, – that successful traders have, I would say it's a really good self-awareness. If you ask a successful trader, you know, what, what's your process? They usually have a pretty good answer and it reflects the fact that they know what they're good at and they know what they're not good at. And when I think about people that I've worked with at, at hedge funds and on trading desks and also individual investors, they have found ways to benefit from their strengths, right? There are things that you're naturally probably good at. Um, mm -hmm. And so set yourself up to benefit from that and and have a clear purpose, right? When I've asked people, what's your trading plan or what's your, what's your edge, what's your process? If they don't have like a well-articulated answer, that's my first answer is, okay, get out a piece of paper and, and, and come up with a much better answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I think the successful traders have a really good sense of, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's what I think my edge is. And here's how I'm trying to do it. Here's what I'm good at. But then there's this other crucial part, which is an awareness of your weaknesses. Here's what I'm not good at. So for me, like I'm not super organized by default, right? My default way of approaching life is disorganized and sort of, uh, you know, whatever a squirrel, like I'm sort of like a dog, just whatever pops up, I'm looking at it. So I've had, that's why I'm so big on routines because I find if I don't have a consistent routine, then I don't have anything. I'm like, yeah. I, I just, I miss it and I skip it and I move on to something else. Yeah. So I know, because I know that, I found ways to use websites like Asana and Monday and Workflowy to organize my thoughts and have a good process. And I have a virtual assistant that helps me make sure that I'm where I need to be when I need to be. <laughs> and so if I didn't have those, I would be much less effective at what I'm trying to do. And so my 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 that's a long-winded way of saying I think having a good self-awareness, which means you know, ha start running a journal with yourself. You know, have a, a journal of your thoughts, not just your trades, but what your mindset is. Mm -hmm. And I bet you'll uncover very quickly what you're good at and what you're not good at. And think about what you can do, what resources, what people, what websites, what tools you can use to help you address your weaknesses. That's how you're going to improve your, your your trading. Okay. So very, very good yeah, self-awareness. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you about books. I mean, we are sort of getting towards the end of the allotted time for this interview. So I, I, could, yeah. I feel like I could talk to you for hours though, David, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I know you've got limited time and so do I. And and we also know sure. that the audience listening to this podcast, uh, you know, is only willing to give us a certain amount of their time. We try and keep these to about 40 minutes each. Um, yeah. So if you had to give three top trading books that you've read and you would highly recommend to anybody. So I'm a voracious reader. I'm big on reading, especially timeless investment wisdom. So this is tough to boil down to three. Um, and uh, and I appreciate the question. First, so first off, I would say just with my focus on mindset and psychology, I would say a book like uh, Trading in the Zone by Mark yeah. Douglas would be a really good place. And always top of it, the it, list. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, and it, it, it's so. I mean, it's about trading and it's about the the art of trading, but it's also about your mental state and your mindset. And, and mm -hmm. again, I find. I love things that you have direct control on and how you approach it, what you look at, what you listen to, what you read, how you use those. Those are all things that you can you can you know really improve on. So I think that's good. Second one, you know, probably wouldn't call it a trading book, but one I would definitely talk about um, as a financial um, 
you know, awareness or a, uh, an investing book uh, would be How to Make Money in Stocks by William O'Neill. Okay. And that's, uh, you know, it's really designed more for, you know, medium term, long term investors, more position trading. But what I think it does brilliantly is, is relate technical analysis to fundamental analysis, which is so important to how I think about the world, which is there are plenty of bad times to buy good companies, right? Yeah. Like there's a good company and a good stock. And you need both of those things working in your favor for something to work out. Um, so I think something like that is a is a really, really important one just to to think about um to think about the relationship between those two. The last one, um, ooh, Bennett Goodspeed. This may be a lesser known okay. one. Bennett Goodspeed wrote a book called The Tao Jones Averages, T-A-O, okay. the Tao Jones yeah. Averages. Okay. And what I love about that one, it, it talks about right brain versus left brain investing. And so okay. as a as a, if you're analyzing a company, if you're analyzing economy, it's a very left brain activity, which is, you know, looking at the evidence and gathering a bunch of data and 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 thinking more about the details. But to be a good trader, to be an investor, you really need to be think more on your right side of your brain, which is more creatively looking at bigger picture patterns and relationships. A good investor is a whole brained investor and understands the detail, but understands the forest for the trees. So that may be a lesser known one that I think would really describe that relation. It really made me think about how I think about the markets. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. I've not heard of that book before, but I'll yeah. definitely go and look it up and, and read it because uh, yeah. it's not been, oh, nobody's brought that up before, but it sounds Beautiful. fascinating. Yeah. Sounds, sounds good. So thank you for that. All right, Dave. Um, how can listeners to this podcast follow your work and give us a plug for the various things you do? I mean, we said that you, you at stockcharts.com. There's a couple of other things that you do as well. Give us all of it. And uh, and how do we follow your work? Yeah, thanks so much, Carl. This, this has been really enjoyable. I really appreciate your thoughtful questions. This has been a lot of fun. Um, you know, so yeah, stockcharts.com is the best place to start. And, you know, I write a lot of content on there. I also host the Closing Bell Show um, yep. for Stock Charts TV. So yep. uh, a lot of, I've met a lot of uh, viewers outside the US that that watch it sort mm -hmm. of the overnight US time. And I think there's a perfect time to just catch up on what happened in the US and thinking about how that relates to whatever markets you might be trading. Yeah. Um, so that's a good place to start. My own website's called marketmisbehavior.com. And I actually run a YouTube channel with that same name, Market Misbehavior, okay. where we really talk about what I call behavioral investing and trading, which is relating your, your mindset and your behavioral tendencies with analysis and technical tools. So uh, hopefully that'd be of interest. And then on Twitter, I'm at dkellercmt and uh, look me up there as well. Yeah, fantastic. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dave. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. And like I said, I could have gone on for, for hours, but uh, we've got time constraints. But thank you again. Uh, it's been fun. And I hope we can get you back again, maybe in another year or so from now. I look forward to it, Carl. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking With Traders, brought to you by IG, a world-leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.